Okay, welcome everybody uh, to Annenberg Conversations on Gender, although of course gender won't be the only thing that we're talking about today. Um, we're very, very excited to have Sarah Lomax-Reese with us, um, who is a long, 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 long time Philly resident. Hopefully that wasn't too many longs. I say that as somebody who's like new to Philly, not as uh, any other <laughs> commentary and um, has been a part of the Philadelphia um, media, media ecosystem and part of the larger um, sort of black media maker ecosystem for um, a lot of her career. And we're very excited to welcome her here today to talk about a, a range of issues um, around uh, women-led and Black-led media, um, as well as, you know, some of the other important and crucial issues that are connected to that topic. So um, thanks again for joining us. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you a bit about Sarah before we jump into our conversation. Sarah Lomax Reese is the president and CEO of Word Radio LLC, which is Pennsylvania's only African-American owned talk radio station. She is credited with transforming Word Radio from a legacy talk radio station to a multimedia communications company, providing cutting edge original programming on air, online, and through community events. In 2017, Sarah led the expansion of 900 AM Word to the FM dial, so it now simulcasts on both 900 AM and 96.1 FM. And in 2018, Sarah spearheaded the launch of an environmental justice journalism platform called EcoWord.com. And in 2019, she launched a new initiative called Livelihood, focused on jobs, career readiness, and entrepreneurship to address the persistent wealth gap in the Black community. And most recently, which we'll be talking about this along with these other things today, she co-founded a new media company called URL Media, which is a network of black and brown owned media organizations that share content distribution and revenues to increase their long-term sustainability. Prior to her work at Word, Radio and URL, she co-founded HealthQuest Total Wellness for Body, Mind and Spirit, which was a trailblazing African-American consumer health magazine that grew from a quarterly publication to a bi-monthly and national circulation of over 500,000. Sarah, of course, is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania um, and also of Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. And she's written for the Miami Herald, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Essence Magazine, and Modern Maturity. In 2016, she contributed to a book of essays, Our Black Sons Matter, written by Black Mothers of Sons. And in 2018, Sarah presented before the Knight Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy. In 2020, uh, Sarah was sought out and featured throughout the media, of course, in sort of the wake of the so-called um, reckoning that the country went to in 2020. And um, she was a coach in the major Metro newspaper table stakes program and was the program lead for the first BIPOC sustainability accelerator funded by Facebook and designed to empower black and brown media organizations. So I could go on and on with this. I should also mention though, before we jump into the conversation that Sarah has received numerous awards um, of which I don't have time to list, but those include being named one of the 100 most influential Philadelphians by Philadelphia Magazine and uh, the Beacon of Light Award from the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, Sarah also has taught a collaborative course here at the University of Pennsylvania with Dr. John Jackson, our Dean, titled Urban Ethnography, where students created audio documentaries uh, that aired on word radio. Um, so I think, uh, although I could say a lot more about, you know, Sarah's work and accomplishments, I'll stop there. It gives us a good sense of how much you've had your tentacles in the um, media scape. Um, and in particular in thinking about um, the need for media that really reflects and represents uh, communities at the margins. And so I thought that we would maybe start by asking you to share a bit, um, both about how you came to run Word and what your vision for Word is, but also um, how you've moved from Word to URL and sort of what the vision for and impetus for URL is. If you could just tell us a bit about both of those projects. Sure, well, thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to, to speak with you and, and the, the community that's um, participating today. Um, 
my my entire professional career has been in this space of uh, independent black media entrepreneurship. Um, you mentioned HealthQuest magazine, which was kind of the my first career uh, building on African American Health magazine, co-founding that with um, Valerie Boyd, who recently passed away. Um, and uh, so this this idea, this drive to um, inform and uh, connect black people with information and resources around critical issues is has been at the at the center of my of my life's work um, in this media space. And so um, my family bought WURD in 2002. And um, my dad was a physician. Um, he really was not a, a, you know, this this long time media entrepreneur, um, but he believed he was like an avid reader. He was very entrepreneurial. He really was about black self-determination, black, um, uh, you know, just just uh, black economic empowerment, all of these things. And so this uh, longtime radio veteran named Cody Anderson, who previously ran WHAT, which was the other black talk radio station in Philadelphia, it was the longtime Black talk station in Philly. It was going out of business. WHAT was going out of business. And Philly has had this long history of Black talk radio in um, as being a, a, an, an accountability vehicle, a, a mouthpiece, an amplifier for uh, the Black community. And so when WHAT was going dark, um, WURD was coming up for sale. And it was a very different format. I think it was a a Latino um, music station at the time. And so Cody Anderson came to my father who was a very successful entrepreneur in the healthcare management space. And so he came to my father and said, doc, you know, a lot of people come to you and, and ask you for money. You can't give everybody money, but with this radio station, you can give everyone a voice. And if you buy this radio station, you're going to be able to empower more people than, um, you know, these onesie twosies. And so that really resonated with my father and he jumped in and, um, and bought WURD. At that time, at the same, at the exact same time that he bought WURD, I was closing down HealthQuest magazine. Um, it was right after 9-11, 2001. And I just, I knew I had run it for 10 years, the magazine. And I knew that everything kind of fell out of the out of the economy. Everything kind of went dark um, after 9-11. And so I knew I could not continue to like struggle. It was it was 10 years of struggle with the magazine. So I closed the magazine down. Cody Anderson, who became the general manager at Word, asked me if I would do a show, a radio show on Word that was basically a radio version of my magazine, a health show. So I did HealthQuest Live for about 10 years on WURD but I had no desire to be involved in the management and the running of, of Word. I, I had been burnt out. I was like kind of in mourning, quite frankly, that my magazine did not survive. And so the radio station really struggled. It was, it was really, um, it was just not doing well financially. It was losing money every month, like lots of money, bleeding money for years, just every year, every month. And so I started to feel like, as I watched from afar, the, the radio station struggling and suffering in, in significant ways. And also my family's name being directly attached to it because everybody knew that, you know, we owned it. And it was just not a, it was not a very, um, it, it wasn't a great product, um, quite frankly. And so after sitting on the sidelines for a very long time, and they, there were conversations about closing the station down. And um, I started feeling like personally, like I was the only one in my family. I'm one of six children. I was the only one in my family who had this media background. You know, I went to Columbia Journalism School. I wrote for papers. I started a magazine. I didn't do, I didn't know radio, but I knew media. I knew the business of media I knew advertising and distribution and content development and marketing and all the pieces that it takes to make a media enterprise run. And so I, um, I started feeling like it was like, you know, personal malpractice for, for me to, for my family's business to be like struggling and me having this expertise 
and willfully sitting on the sidelines. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to stick my toe in and I put together a, an event, you know, because I, I the, there was a whole management structure in place. I didn't want to like come in and disrupt that. So I did one, I just like stuck my toe in. It went, you know, the things that I put my hands on went really well. And so my family started asking me, can you do a strategic plan? Can you, you know, can you um, do a, a business plan? What does this look like in five years? And so I started doing that. And eventually, like very quickly, they asked me to basically step in as the, the general manager and the president. And so in 2010, that's what I did. I, I um, took it on and um, started running WURD. And it was hard <laughs> to put it mildly because it's one thing, and, and that kind of pivots to URL, uh -huh. um, because it's one thing to start something from scratch, which is what we have done with URL. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to inherit a an, an organization that is not performing and mm -hmm. there's a lot of infrastructure there's a, a whole staff there's a whole prop there's a whole kind of engine that is not really working that you have to figure out how to re-engineer that's in my experience having started url in 2021 it's much harder to kind of rehabilitate and, and figure out how to turn something, especially a legacy um, media organization that was really in the dumps to try and turn that around and reinvigorate, reimagine it and, um, and, and get it on an upward trajectory. Um, one other thing or a couple other things about Word is the way that I was able to kind of, kind of um, turn it around was one, making it very multimedia and really leaning into the thing that people thought was like a weakness, which was the, the you know, the, the it's an AM talk radio station was what it was when I inherited it. People saw that as like, ah, who listens to AM? And I was like, well, you know what? Let's lean into this. We're the only black talk station in Pennsylvania. We're the only one that's doing this work. Let's, instead of like, like, you know, being embarrassed or ashamed of the fact that we are, you know, a, 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 a thousand watt AM station. Let's lean into that and let's build all of these other things that amplify that. So social media and, you know, digital platforms, you know, website and events. And, you know, now we do video. So like really making it a much more multimedia robust um, organization and really, building the content and trying, and, and we still have, have a way to go, um, but we, we were able to kind of tell a different story because we, we weren't um, looking at ourselves from a deficit mindset, but mm -hmm. also from a, but more from a, um, you know, what we're bringing to this ecosystem mm -hmm. that nobody else is. And so, um, and frankly, you know, a, a big part of our transformation happened um, starting in probably 2018, 2019, when uh, grantors started philanthropic organizations, recognized that what we were doing really was a community service. It really was, right. even though we're a for-profit business, right. we were doing things that, that were very much about empowering community. And so we started getting grants from phil philanthropic organizations. And then when 2020 happened, and you know the quote unquote racial reckoning that's when we started seeing more opportunities on the corporate front as well as the philanthropic front and so things have have kind yeah. of um uh gotten a lot uh, a lot better from a from an economic standpoint yeah. um in 2020 pivoting to url url stands for uplift respect and love and um, I participated in a program in 2019 at Harvard that was called the Media Transformation Challenge. And it was, it used to be called the Salzberger Program. And it uh, was for media leaders from around the world. And I met this woman, Mitra Kalita, who was the senior VP at CNN at the time. And she and I, you know, we, we hit it off, we became friends. And um, in 2020, when a lot of people were quitting their jobs at mainstream media because of the racial reckoning and the complicity of, of media in, in uh, racism and systemic um, oppression. Um, and, and there was lots, there was just like so much on the table 
that was wrong. And that, that was, was like in the spotlight up and trying to be fixed. And so Mitra called me and she was like, Sarah, we got to do something right now. This is the moment let's, let's come together. So we, in a series of conversations, we arrived at this place where, you know, I've been obviously, like I just said, I've been running word for, you know, 10 years. I had run health quests for 10 years before that. I know that there are all these high performing black and brown owned media organizations that have been doing the work. Mm -hmm. They have audience, they have revenues, but they also struggle. They're also, you know, um, there, there are um, challenges that, that we face as hyper-local, independent, Black-owned and Brown-owned media organizations. So the idea that we came up with was, what if instead of starting a new, um, you know, a, a new uh, newsletter or, or just a, a new website that, that covered Black and Brown issues, what if we created a network of high-performing, Black and Brown owned media organizations like Word. Um, mm -hmm. Word is one of the, the members we have. We, so we created this network called URL Media. Right now it's 10 independently owned Black and Brown owned media organizations that make up the network. We share content, mm -hmm. we share revenues, we share distribution. So we amplify each other's work. And it's really an opportunity to make what we do um, bigger. And, and reach more people and help to create greater financial viability and sustainability for BIPOC owned media organizations by through this, this, um, this aggregation, through this collaboration, we're able to reach and, and access national advertisers and people that want to reach um, Latinx and, and um, Black American and South Asian and you know Native American and immigrant communities and and so that's we have these ten different organizations that represent these different um, audiences and it's been amazing you know we're a year old and um, you know we we have gotten incredible press we've gotten incredible support from the philanthropic um, universe and it's all about just trying to to enhance the work that we're all doing as individual organizations so that we get more resources and we get more reach. And so far yeah. it's um, it's working. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, thank you so much for giving us that really generative <laughs> background. Yeah, no, but it's, it's exactly what I asked for. And I, I love that. I'd love to hear you talk about, I mean, I think for, for you as somebody who has worked in, um, you know, black owned media spaces, for me who studies, um, you know, black media makers, we sort of in, intuitively and, and and think obviously that people understand the need for these kind of resources. But I wonder if you could talk a bit because I mean, word is a very hyper local thing. You know, it's 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 based here in Philly. It's Pennsylvania specific, and URL is obviously a, a much bigger umbrella and en encompasses organizations that are are black and brown led across the country. And I wonder if you could talk just a bit about you know, why you think that media that specifically focuses on underserved communities, particularly black and brown communities, continues to be um, sort of so crucial in, in our society from, from your perspective. Sure, sure. So, you know, um, I'll speak specifically about black media because that's really where I've, I've lit, where I live. And, um, you know, the, the reality is that their the mainstream media, white led media does not cover black and brown communities in authentic and consistent ways. They never have. And I think that until kind of the construct of um, mainstream media shifts dramatically, they, they never will. And so, you know, we've been trying to figure out this DEI, this diversity, this um, diversifying the newsroom conundrum forever you forever. know this this yeah. has been you know like the, my entire career they've been trying to figure this this thing out and um i sat on a board uh the lenfest institute board which is of journalism philanthropy and i was like you know i was like a one note nelly while i was on that board that it's not just about adding black and brown people to mainstream newsrooms that's not what you know, really in, 
in empowering and creating a more just media ecosystem. It's really putting more resources in black and brown owned media. And so this ownership piece to me is so critical mm. because that is, you know, your, your, your whole paradigm is a bit different. You are not just covering the community, you are the community. And so, you know, I look at Word and the, the organizations in URL, like we are hiring, we are grooming, we are, are training black and brown people in this space. So it's not just about talking about the issues that we're concerned about. We are also trying to create um, opportunities and uh, economic sustainability and viability for people who work with us as well as the institutions. The reason, and we also, you know, we often are covering issues that are um, relevant and, and newsworthy earlier than mainstream mm -hmm. media because sure. we yeah. are so connected with, we are, we are serving audiences that oftentimes mainstream media overlooks or undervalues or is just disconnected from. And so, you know, I think that, that if we are financially empowered, if we have um, the, the, the economic resources, that allow us to really scale and build and experiment and innovate, then, you know, really the sky is the limit. The reality is that forever, I mean, the first black newspaper started in 1827. So from, from the very beginning, black media, black and brown media, I'll just say black media has really been starved for resources. Mm -hmm. and, and have, have done a lot with very little. And you could say that probably for most black businesses too. But um, you know, the, so, so there's always been a struggle around capacity building, around you know, like, like talent recruitment and retention. And, and it's really interesting um, now where there is this heightened desire for more black and brown people in mainstream spaces, mainstream newsrooms, it becomes even more challenging for our, our, our organizations to be able to compete. Because if the New York Times is coming after you with like, you know, $170,000 as a, as a salary, it's really tough for our organizations to be able to compete for that, that kind of talent because of the, the, uh, the economic realities. But, right. um, but at the same time, the flip side of that is because there's so many black and brown people who have been, you know, traumatized and and kind of um, had very bad experiences in these mainstream newsrooms, there are a lot of them who are saying, you know what, I don't have to make as much as I would make at the New York Times or mm -hmm. the Washington Post. Right. I want to be in an organization that I can help build and and grow and be valued for my full the full humanity of who I am. I don't have to explain that. I don't have to like come, you know, wearing the mask as, as, as said. Um, so, yeah. And I think, I mean, on that front, I would love to hear you talk about, because we've sort of, we, we've, we've named here the complicity of, you know, what often is called legacy or mainstream media. But if we're, if we're being honest, what is often called legacy in mainstream media is historically white media, right? I mean, until very recently in American history was, was largely entirely segregated media. Um, and the complicity that that media uh, has played, um, even in the contemporary era, um, in uh, racism and sexism and sort of other things, uh, you know, other forms of of uh, oppression in our society. And in the post twenty twenty moment, there was this push by a lot of these legacy organizations where they were owning up to this. So, for example, um, the Los Angeles Times. Uh, editorial board wrote basically an apology saying, you know, we've been complicit in perpetuating police narratives and perpetuating stereotypes as, of Black people as criminal and, you know, all these things. And then there has been this other move from sort of the media activist side um, about media reparations and saying, okay, well, <laughs> if you've been complicit and you're sorry, you know, let's like figure out how people can put their money where their mouth is and actually fund and support 
um, these communities in some ways that have been harmed. And so I'd love to hear you talk about your take on this. Like, what do you think of those apologies? Do you think they're useful? Do you think they're just symbolic? And what do you, what's your take on the, on the media reparations conversation as well? Yeah, I mean, I do think they're meaningful and I do think they're symbolic. Um, I, I think they're, but I think that it's a step. Um, it's, 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 it's a, it's an important, um, step. It's long overdue. Um, I, I read something earlier today that, um, U.S. newspapers published more than 200,000 paid runaway slave ads. Okay. So, so, the thing that's so fascinating to me is that because the media, the media oftentimes does not get scrutinized for its complicity in systemic racism and oppression, but it absolutely has been at the heart of it. And so that's what I really appreciate about like Media 2070, which is about media reparations, right. is they are saying, they are saying, you know, you guys, we have to look at the media, not as the, because, you know, as you know, Sarah, this, this myth of the media as kind of like objective, you know, we don't, we don't project our viewpoint or opinion, you know, it's, it's, it's just the man, it's just the facts, man, please. And we know that that is like such hogwash, I'll say it's such BS. <laughs> right. Um, we know that that everyone comes to their work, to their lives with, you know, it's it's colored by their experiences and 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 their their worldview, and so um, this notion that the media can can be absolved of its own complicity in perpetuating um, stereotypes and and like I said, systemic oppression is ridiculous. And so I appreciate what the LA Times um, and here in Philly, the Inquirer is doing its own kind of self-analysis. But very quickly, that you know that becomes, um, like you said, symbolic, and it needs to be married with tangible, systemic um, solutions and ways. And and to me. The reality for Black people in particular in this country is that we have been starved for financial resources. We have been unable to get loans. We've been unable to get investment. We've been unable to get raises and, and high, you know, high level positions. Um, and, and all of that needs to be addressed in, in holistic ways to make sure that, and, and I, I also think that, that um, mainstream white led media organizations, they, they, they need to do that outward facing analysis and, and, and you know, falling on the sword, mea culpa, but they also need to do the inward reflection. Like who are they doing business with? Are they working with black owned businesses? Do they have a, a law firm or a accounting firm um, that that is uh, BIPOC owned or led? You know, do how are they? Media organizations are huge businesses, and we know that local media has been on its heels. There, the the economics for local media has been you know like really struggling for a while. But we also know that major empires were made on the backs of media. So we know that, that, that they are big businesses. And so they need to be looking at, especially in a city like Philadelphia, that's almost 44% black. How are they contributing to addressing the, the, the racial wealth gap in Philadelphia? How are they supporting um, black and brown owned businesses in, in a way that is beyond hiring black and brown talent, which is important and promoting and, and making sure the leadership is reflective of the city, but how are they spending their money? And I think that that too is a part of the media reparations. And, and how are they collaborating with the rest of the ecosystem? How are they collaborating with black and brown owned media organizations in Philadelphia and beyond? And is it a paternalistic relationship, which it often is, um, or is it a, a real, you know, um, 
you know, relationship of, of, of equals. And how do you find, you know, even if you're, you're very different sizes, how do you find the strengths of a, a smaller organization? So it's not just you big footing them and they're like at the kitty table and you're making all the decisions, which often happens. I've been there many times. Um, and so, so there's so much to, to work with um, because the reality is our organizations have been, um, have been kind of, we've been underfunded, we've been under-resourced. And mm -hmm. so we don't have the same kind of heft, but how do you begin to, to, to equalize that and, and create more parity? in very intentional ways. And so it has to not just be, yeah, we've, we've, we've participated in, in um, you know, stereotyping and all that stuff and my bad. It has to be much, much, much deeper right. and, and, and long-term. And the last thing I'll say about that is we know that white institutions, white people get fatigued around these issues pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I can feel it now after the 2020, you know, um, reckoning, I can feel kind of like, all right, enough with this BIPOC crap. I'm sick of it. So I think that the other role that black and brown media organizations have is to keep the pressure on. Right. And that's why media reparations and all of that, it can't be something that, because it's the, the, the harm goes back so far and it's so deep and it is so com complete and complex mm -hmm. that it, it, we can't get tired because it's hard and complex. Right, right. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that. And I sort of wanted to ask you a question, you know, as you talk and I listen to you, I'm thinking about the way that um, women of color in particular have really been visionaries in the space of media and founding institutions. And I mean, that is whether we're talking about Ida B. Wells um, or we're talking about, you know, both of your, uh, your co-founder for your magazine was also a woman of color. Your most recent co-founder, um, Mitra with URL is South Asian American, I believe, right? And um, and uh, recently, I, I heard you did did an interview with the folks from Capital B, which was just launched, which is you know two women of color at the helm. And so I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about the intersection here. Um, it, I actually was laughing when you said people are tired of hearing about race because I feel like I I like you know pulled a little bait and switch, like people tuned in for conversation on gender, and it <laughs> turns out that. Um, you know, Black people are women too. And so we're having a conversation <laughs> about gender, about race, right? But I mean, I would love to hear you talk about, particularly you think the role that women of color media makers and founders of media organizations are playing in, in this moment um, and maybe some of the unique contributions there. Sure, sure. I mean, I would add Nicole Hannah-Jones in that. Yeah, in that too, so because, many. Because, yeah, so many. Um, you know, I... I um, I really, I, I just feel so strongly that our voices and our kind of um, work uh, ethic, I guess, is is um, is unparalleled. You know, there's um, again, my whole career has been kind of joined at the hip with other women <laughs> of color um, advancing these these um, these projects, and um, I think that. I don't know whether, I, I mean, and I, some people might take me to task on this, but there is something about women who there's not a lot of ego. There's, it's, it's like, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to get it done. I don't care if I'm the president. I don't care if I'm the chairman or chairwoman. I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to get it done. And that kind of lack of ego and um, I think essential collaborative spirit and is, is, is really, um, is really powerful and it moves the needle in ways that, you know, cause you, you're just taking, you're taking a couple of things off the table. It's not like, well, you know, I'm the president. And so I'm, this isn't in my job description. It's really like, you know, how do we, how do we get this done and, yeah. and, and I think that that is, that's my, been my experience yeah. in terms of um, a, 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 a yeah. bit of a gender, um, 
it's like asking. the connection to community that the you know like the women of color uh, media folks are very much invested in the community as opposed to maybe you know individual glory and I think that we have we can see that throughout history as well yeah um, okay, I wanted to ask you one more question that's burning for me before we jump into the great questions that are being submitted in the Q&A. If folks do have Q&A questions, feel free to drop them in there. Um, I wanted to ask you about myths and disinformation because obviously this is, you know, a hot topic, um, maybe now perpetually, <laughs> um, but uh, in particular, the role that you think um, you know, uh, black and brown and women owned media can play in this larger ecosystem and concern about addressing uh, misinformation and disinformation. How do you feel like you do that particularly well? Do you feel like there's room for improvement? And how do you sort of engage on mis and disinformation, uh, you know, in these in these platforms and, and with particularly the communities and audiences that you're targeting? That's a that's a great it's a great question and um, you know we know that that disinformation misinformation is they're they're big 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 issues because we know in the 2020 presidential election that black communities in particular were targeted with uh, disinformation to to um, you know to to try and change the outcome uh, or influence the outcome of the presidential election. Um, I think that, you know, we, Word is an African-American talk radio station and we basically don't have a whole lot of uh, screening protocols or anything like that. So if you call up, um, you can get on and you can yeah. ask a question or you can make a comment. And I know for a fact, we have trolls. We have people who are calling up and planting, you know, disinformation um, and, we also know that, um, and, and so we try very hard to counter that and, mm -hmm. and create, you know, um, clear narratives around, like we, we saw it a lot with, with COVID and the vaccine and, and all of that. Um, and so we, we try and be very clear, very um, uh, direct with uh, addressing things that we can identify clearly as, as uh, misinformation or disinformation. Um, but we also recognize that there are a plurality of, of views and there is a real um, foundation for black people to be skeptical and to question about, you know, vaccines and, and scientific things. And, and because we have a history where right. our people were used as guinea pigs or were used as, um, you know, so, so we are so ripe for these kind of campaigns, Black people in particular, because there are legitimate, you know, um, historical and probably contemporary um, examples of how we were absolutely um, targeted for nefarious things, mm -hmm. and so um, it's it, it's not it's not a big leap for us to believe a conspiracy theory because those things actually happened in the past, and so you know there is um, there is a specific organization AI for the people that is working with black owned. And, and brown owned media organizations to try and address and build um, build strategies to to make sure we we are being proactive around mis and disinformation. Um, but you know, and the the answer is you know we're doing our we're doing okay. Can we do better? Absolutely. Um, do we you know is it essential in terms of the future of kind of, you know, um, trust in and, and having, um, having the credibility as a, as a media organization to, to be able to really in real time, you know, correct misinformation, disinformation. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, like I was told that the difference between misinformation and disinformation, disinformation is intentionally there, there right. there's an agenda. Misinformation, right. you're just saying something and you don't really know. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. So um, so anyway, I think that that there's 
there's a lot of work that has to be done because critical thinking skills are not being taught in you know schools and in 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 elementary and junior and and a lot of schools are not equipping our young people with the ability to to think critically there was a there was something somebody called up on word not too long ago maybe two weeks ago and people might have heard this one at saying that um president biden had put in to some bill the some some uh Oh, is this the okay. crack pipe thing the crack that you pipe thing. distribute crack pipes? Right. And it was right. a total planted thing, like right wing plant disinformation right. project. Right. Yeah. Right. But it got but it, circulated in it, black media. Yeah. Right. right. So, you know, it's um, there are things that that have to be again, I think we're we're really talking about systems. Mm -hmm. We really have to look at, OK, how do we equip our young people, our older people, how do we edu how do we create a, a more robust educational system so that people have more uh, discernment, you know, mm -hmm. like like there's there's an ability to, whether it's reading mainstream media or listening to word, you 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 think you're you we should be critical about all of it. Mm -hmm. We should yeah. be critical about all of it. I want to jump into the, the questions because we have some great Q and A's here. Um, and my colleagues, um, Michael De La Carpini and Barbie oh. Zelzer asked, yeah, they asked similar questions. They first said, great to see you. Um, but also they both asked about the current uh, Philadelphia Inquirer situation. So um, I will read Barbie's question. I think it kind of also gets to the question that Michael asked. Um, so uh, Barbie said, thanks for your very thoughtful remarks. I'm wondering if you could reflect on Wesley Lowry's recent report on the Inquirer in which he claimed that the news organization has missed multiple opportunities to diversify, remaining largely a paper by and for white residents of Philadelphia. Um, given you know, your experiences with black media, do you feel that there is a way to encourage greater, greater inclusiveness at the Inquirer? And if so, how? And similarly, Michael asked basically, is there really hope for change at the at their Inquirer essentially? <laughs> so it's good to hear your name, Michael Del Carpini. Um, it's been a minute. Um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that, that the Inquirer is um, any organization, it's really, it, it stems from the top. It, it really comes from the top. And I, I will say, because I read the Inquirer a lot, and I do, I do see evolution in the coverage, in the, the focus. I think that it's a better paper now than it was, you know, two, three years ago. Um, I've seen some excellent reporting on, you know, um, gun violence and public education and, and, and things like that. Um, so I do, I do see evolution, but the reality is that um, it is, you know, the, the, for most local newspapers, they're, their competing interests. Um, who is their subscriber base? Probably mostly white people in the suburbs. Um, who, so, so who are they writing for? Are they writing for their subscriber base or are they writing for an audience that they're trying to attract? Right. And, 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 and is, is like, maybe, maybe they will, maybe they won't like resonate with them. So I think that, that that's a fundamental challenge is who is the audience? Because if, you're, if, if, if your audience is, you know, mainline Radnor living, you know, upper middle-class white folks, then, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a different, that's a different audience. And so, you know, I think that, that if your audience is Philadelphia, which is again, like about 44% black, Right. Then that's a that's a different conversation. But I think that um, it's just good business in 2022 to have a diverse, a, a highly diverse staff, particularly to cover a city like Philadelphia. But again, like I said earlier, it has to go beyond just the um, you know the 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 staff configuration. It has to be who's in the leadership. Who is, um, you know, how are you actually spending your money to empower 
uh, mm -hmm. communities of color. How are you working in the city to um, engage and empower um, as, as a, a major institution in the city? So, I mean, I think that, that, that all of the things that Wesley Lowry pointed to are, are like dead on. And the question is, what is the inquiry going to do now that right. it's been, right. that it's, it's like out there in the public? And that's what I, that's what I'm really curious about. Like what, where do you go from here to, you know, repair or, or, you know, um, just change your direction? Right. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. We have three really great questions from students. I want to try to squeeze them in before we run out of time. Um, uh, one student asks, um, uh, this is anonymous, so I, I'm fortunately I don't know who asked, but as a young Black woman, one of my fears about going into the media industry is that it seems uncertain, like an uncertain profession versus maybe a more corporate career. What advice do you have for young women to push past this fear who want to go into the industry? So I would just say at this point in my life, everything is uncertain. Mm. There's, there's, there's no guarantees. There are no guarantees. I mean, yes, media is, is you know, there it's, it's evolving. Um, I think that there are certain careers in media that are probably more, um, more steady or, or more um, reliable or, or, you know, the media, I mean, there's, there's tons of, of opportunities in this thing we call the media. There's the creative side, the, the reporting and writing and editing side. So that's the content side. There's the business side, there's sales and marketing and um, distribution. There's, you know, the biz, the, the, the like big business side, there's investing, like how do you actually create, like find capital to either buy or um, or or build media organizations. So there's there's a lot of you know the media is a business. So there are lots of there's lots of different parts of it. Um, so you know there there are different avenues in the media, but and there are also much more stable media organizations that you can you can um, uh, try and get into. I have been an entrepreneur, media. So risk is like in my blood. So. I'm, I've <laughs> never worked any place where um, it was safe, basically. Mm. <laughs> it's been, it's been like, I've been kind of, you know, um, doing the high wire thing my, my entire career. So, um, but, but my previous answer stands. Yeah. There are lots of op options. Great, thanks so much. Um, so we have a question from Jing Wang, who's one of our graduate students um, at, at Annenberg. Um, or maybe, is that right? Hopefully that's right. I can't remember if she's a postdoc or grad student, sorry. Um, <laughs> but the question is, it's inspiring to hear stories about black and brown community voices from radio infrastructure. Um, during the pandemic, the white dominant media industry because of in institutionalized racism has reported on or presented a lot of tensions in particular between Asian and black communities. And so she's curious if there are any current or future collaborations between word and Asian communities here in Philadelphia that might promote interracial solidarity? Wow, you know, that's great such, a great, yeah. such a great question. And we had a URL um, uh, in-person meeting yesterday in New York. And this was like, this was what we were talking about. We, we said, we've got to do some type of round table. It wasn't necessarily Philly based, but, but we could do it in Philly. We've got to do some type of roundtable because we were talking about the tension in the education space, and and because you know the the whole I know that in New York there's a whole tension around these um, special admit high schools and the fact that you know Asian students are concerned that they're being locked out because the 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 rules are being changed so that more Black students can can be considered, and so I do think that there's like like a really interesting conversation to be had about, I mean, and even like the affirmative action, um, you know, uh, challenge or the challenge to affirmative action. It's, a, it's now an Asian student. It started off Baki back in, I guess, I don't know when that was, the 90s or the 80s, who was white, but now it, the, the face of this challenge to affirmative action in the college level 
is an Asian person. And so this, this, you know, this pitting of black and Asian communities against each other is real. Um, we saw that with, you know, I think in, in Philly with the, these Asian students being beaten up by, by, by black students. Um, so the tensions, having a really nuanced conversation is, is, is what's needed that acknowledges there is intra-racial bias, you know, there, there is bias against black people, I think in some parts of the Asian community, there's bias against Asian people in some parts of the black community. So not like glossing over that, but figuring out how do we have authentic conversations so that we can develop um, a more um, a more constructive relationship. And I think that that's one of the, the, the real superpowers of the media is that you can facilitate conversations that can that could potentially change the way people think and the way people act. And so, yeah, I, we're, we're, we're working on that. Um, so thank you for that question. Yeah, great question. And apologies to Jean. This is what happens when you don't have faces and you haven't seen people because there's been a pandemic basically <laughs> very often, but Jing is actually manages card, which is our, our global communication center and is a senior researcher there. So I, I'm sorry for calling you a student, but there's nothing wrong with being a student because our students are amazing. But I wanted to get, I wanted to get the title in there correctly. Um, we do have a question from Florence, who I know for sure is one of our students. <laughs> um, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been incredible. Uh, you spoke earlier about what media companies can do better, but I'm curious if you can say more about what us as media scholars can do better, perhaps alongside practitioners and inside and outside of the academy. How do we in the academy basically you know, support the kind of work that you're doing? I would say really simply just tell the truth. Tell the truth, tell the, the real stories. Um, you know, I mean, this, this whole question of critical race theory, which we know is like kind of in the legal, the legal domain, but you know, so much is not told about the racial and gender dimensions that that co literally color the way that we we talk about all of these things and so you know as a black woman that is my lens and i would love to see it not just be people like me using that lens but really looking at like what is kind of the the full story you know, diversify your, your experts, you know, make sure you're talking to people who have lots of different experiences, not just the people who, you know, um, have all the, the letters behind their names, you know, dig a little bit deeper. There's incredible wisdom in, in, in this space that, um, if you, if you expand kind of your, um, your um, framework, you'll get a, you might get a whole different story. Yeah, yeah. So I would, I would say, um, I would say that. That's great. And we have so many folks at Annenberg, I think right now, especially who are doing projects that are really focusing on these questions of studying media through the lens of whose voices have been left out or sort of like what perspectives um, haven't been included and, and, and trying to sort of, you know, address that in, in the scholarship and, and not just, you know, in, in the practice as well. So thank you for that um, question, Florence. Um, okay, we that's all of our questions. We have about five minutes left, but I figure it's Friday. So, I mean, I, I guess I'll say, Sarah, this has been a great conversation. And if you have any, you know, like parting thoughts or ideas or things that you wanted to share, you're, you're welcome to do that. But I, I hope folks have gotten um, a lot out of this. And um, uh, yeah, anything that anything you want to add? Yeah, I would just say, you know, check us out, wordradio.com. I um, dropped all the links in the chat. So everybody, okay. I dropped the word link, the URL link, and a couple other links that you mentioned in the chat. Okay, great. Um, sign up for the URL newsletter. We come out every week. Um, you know, and, and I guess um, we're right here in Philly. You know, I'm here in Philly. Y'all are in Philly. Um, if there are ways that that we can collaborate, can um, 
you know, explore partnerships. Um, you know, I'm a Penn grad and uh, I know John Jackson well and Michael Del Carpini. And so, you know, really open to figuring out because, you know, I, I just think that um, collaborations, just like mm -hmm. with URL is this collaboration of, of BIPOC media organizations, collaborations are the, the, are going to be the, the bread and butter of local media and just media in general to like scale and to reinforce and to innovate and to, to just reimagine how we do what we do. And I just know that the, the talent and the brain power at Penn is exceptional. So I just like put that invitation out there. I agree. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thanks so much. This has been great. And I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone.